Welcome to Bible study with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. I'm glad you've chosen to join us for this, our second part in our Advent series of studies. As we approach Christmas, the church spends four weeks in the season of Advent, a season of preparation and waiting, reflection and penitence as we get ready for the joy, not only of the birth of Christ, but the promise of Christ's return someday. As the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church prepares for Christmas, we're glad you have joined us for this, our opportunity to read scripture and reflect a bit and have an opportunity as time allows us in our personal lives to use these online resources as part of our devotional life. As we turn to scripture, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, in this season of preparation where we are told to be patient and to wait, even when the world around us is hustling and bustling with excitement, we thank you for the permission to have patience, for the reminder that we need to wait, for the acknowledgement of promises fulfilled, promises yet to unfold, and the amazing ways you are working in our lives right now through the gift of your Holy Spirit. As we read words from the past, foretelling a future that is the past yet to us, we are reminded that we now are telling and unfolding your story and talking about what you will do and are doing as a people filled with hope. Guide us in this time of reflection and study. Allow us to be fully present with your word and filled with your Holy Spirit. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. So the second week of Advent, again, a time of preparation, a time of waiting, a time of acknowledging the celebration and truth of the birth of Jesus Christ, the inbreaking of God into our world, Emmanuel, God with us, this wonderful, joyous occasion that many around the world celebrate. It's also our time to think about the promise that Christ gave that he would someday return to usher in a new heaven and new earth and return all of creation to God's good intentions for it. As we look for the signs and signals of that promised return, it's good to look back and remind ourselves of the messages, the signs, the wonders, the promises, the things that were told for generation after generation to the Hebrew people as they awaited their promised Messiah. We in our worship time most recently looked at the prophet Malachi and how he prepared those getting ready for their savior. And I want to now turn to very familiar words from the prophet Isaiah, words written about 2,600 years ago, words written 600 years probably before the birth of Christ, words that were written to a divided kingdom when Israel and Judah were divided into northern and southern kingdoms and there was tension between the people infighting amongst God's people in the promised land. And there was also very real threats from outsiders, invaders, and this understanding that if we are obedient to God, God will continue to fulfill the covenant this promise to God's people that if you are my people and I am your God, you will have a land to call home and be safe. Yet the people time and time again, generation after generation, have broken that covenant, have worshiped false gods, have betrayed God, have heard God's message and just turned and done the opposite. And at those times, God's protection has been withdrawn and they've known what it is to be unprotected and to then have to deal with the very real tension with their neighboring nations. So the prophet Isaiah is speaking to a broken kingdom, speaking to a people who are in need of salvation, speaking to people who are looking for something better, yet struggling and falling into temptation and sin and not being able to focus completely on God's intentions for them as individuals and for their community. So these words from Isaiah, the first few verses I read you are gonna be very familiar. I want to put them in context and read the rest of this passage and see why were these words so meaningful then and how have they become so meaningful to us now. So in Isaiah chapter 9, we usually read the first seven verses as part of our Advent preparations. So here are these very familiar words. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but the future in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. <clears throat> and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. 
You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, <clears throat> the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in the battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning with the fuel of the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's usually where we pause in our Advent readings. That's usually where we stop because that's the exciting part. That's the climax. After all these battles, after bloodshed, after division, God will break in and bring us this wonderful Messiah, this everlasting Father, this Messiah who's somehow in the line of Jesse and David, who will bring restoration, redemption, and wholeness to God's people and an end to all this conflict. That sounds like a great thing. It sounds great if you end at the end of verse 7. For many Christians for generations since, we have seen this fulfilled and believe it to be fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ, who fulfilled all of these prophetic things. A child is born. We refer to him as mighty God, a prince of peace. The increase of his kingdom will have no end. And his peace will have no end. All these things we've seen happen. He establishes and upholds justice and righteousness forever. And all of it happens because of the zeal or the desire, the excitement of God to make it happen. But if you continue to read this prophecy from Isaiah, you see that the people are still struggling very much with justice issues, with friction, with infighting. And that's why this breaking in of the Messiah does not happen immediately. It does not happen within the first generation of those who heard the prophet speak these words. We continue in verse 8. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say with pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have felled, but we will replace them with cedars. But the Lord has strengthened Rezin's foes against them and has spurred their enemies on. Armenians from the east and the Philistines from the west have devoured Israel with an open mouth. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. But the people have not returned to him who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. So the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail, both palm branch and reed in a single day. The elders and the prominent men are the head. The prophets who teach lies are the tail. Those who guide this people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. Therefore, the Lord will take no pleasure in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless or widows. For everyone is ungodly and wicked. Every mouth speaks vileness. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. So there's a promise of this coming Messiah, this redemption, this wonderful thing God's going to do. But why? Because the people are really awful right now. The people are just miserably wicked. And God sees it. God sees it and sees their need. But the people have not said they want a Savior. They've been promised one, and they're still misbehaving. They're not living at all like they're getting ready for God to fulfill this awesome promise. They're just continuing to live their lives selfishly, short-sightedly, in the moment, casting aside God's plans and promises for a future filled with hope and wholeness and peace. Isaiah continues in verse 18. Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched and the people will be fuel for the fire. No one will spare his brother. On the right, they will devour, but still be hungry. On the left, they will eat, but not be satisfied. Each will feed on the flesh of his own offspring. Manasseh will feed on Ephraim and Ephraim on Manasseh. Together they will turn against Judah. Yet for all this, 
God's anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. The people remain unrepentant and godless. The people remain in defiance of God's intentions for them. They continue to break the covenant. So Isaiah, like many of God's messengers, brings this prophecy, this promise of a future time when God's peace will be reigned in forever and says, you can have this, but you have to want it. You have to be able to receive it. You have to prepare yourself for what God's going to do. Why would God break in and save you for you just to say, nah, I don't want that? Why would God come here and reveal God's self in the person of Jesus Christ just to have the people go, nah? God needs to know that the people want it. God needs to know the people are ready for, to receive him. So that when Emmanuel, God with us, comes, there's someone for God to be with. At this point, the people aren't ready. It takes them five to 600 years to get to a point where God thinks enough of the population is prepared and ready. As we've spoken about with other prophecies in the Hebrew scripture, part of that preparation is sending a messenger, as we identify as John the Baptist, to get the people ready in that immediate generation, just in the weeks and months leading up to Jesus' adult ministry and public ministry, to baptize people, to cleanse them, to make them spiritually disciplined and devotionally aware. They need to get ready. That when God's going to do something, if you're so distracted and engrossed by your own selfish sinning, you're going to miss it. If you're so consumed with your own anger and wrath and revenge, and God steps in, you're going to be too focused on yourself to see what God is doing. So the preparations this Advent season invite us to remember this call from the prophetic voice to get your house in order so that when God arrives, you're ready to get your heart cleansed and pure, to repent, to be penitent, to turn away from sin and towards God, seeking grace and forgiveness and saying, I'm ready. God, you're doing a new thing? I'm on board. I'm ready to leave behind the sin and selfishness, this focus on only me and my needs and the immediate realities around me, to say, God, what's your plan? I'm on board. Let's do this together. Let's see it unfold. Allow your spirit to lead me. The people needed to hear it 2,500 years ago. And the people, including you and I, need to hear it again today. In getting ready for the joy of Christmas. In getting ready to be able to celebrate and give thanks and proclaim the good news shouted from the mountaintops that Jesus Christ is born, our Savior has come, our Messiah is with us. In order to celebrate that, we have to want it and see it as something we need and understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And in order to understand that, we need to prepare ourselves, read scripture, to pray, come before God with humble hearts and say, yeah, I've misstepped, I've done wrong, I've turned away from your long plans for me to give in to immediate temptations. And I need your help. And by saying that to God and saying, God, I need you, then when we celebrate the joy of Christmas, we're ready to receive that good news and to truly celebrate who Christ is, who God is revealed in this little baby in Bethlehem, who will then be raised in the human world experience everything you and I have, be tempted, but still remain without sin to truly fully live into the role as our Savior. So this Advent season, I invite you to look at Scripture, to read these familiar passages, but to read them in context and to realize the people who first heard them were not perfect people. They were not the most holy people. They were not the people who were sitting prayerfully just waiting for God to do something. There are people leading lives that were very broken and real. There are people like you and I. And if they needed to prepare, then we need to prepare. We're given four weeks every year to specifically focus on that preparation. You might think it's too long. Some years you might not think it's long enough. But we're invited to purposely engage and wrestle with Scripture to get ready and to be able to turn to God and say, I need a Savior. And when that Savior breaks into my life, I need to be focused and prepared enough to recognize him and respond and receive that grace I'm being offered. Thank you for joining me for this part two in our four-part Advent series. 
You can find other Bible study lessons on our YouTube channel. You can also worship with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church in person on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Or you can find our worship videos posted later on our website and our YouTube channel and also access them through our Facebook page. Thank you again for joining me on this Advent journey of preparation. And God bless you and our entire congregation and our entire world as we prepare for the coming of our Messiah. Amen.